The goal of these display technologies is to recreate a sense of depth, of three-dimensional reality. It's what televisions can't really do. And so you start with first principles, and here they are. Every vision textbook has a taxonomy of depth cues. And for most of us in this field, we've been working in what's known as the vista space. Objects that are far beyond where you can take action, way beyond the end of this room, looking out to the beautiful San Francisco skyline, that's the vista space. And the cues that dominate there, of course, are occlusion. Is the bridge in front of the hills? Relative size, are the cars appearing bigger near me or smaller further away? Aerial perspective, fog, you get an absolutely great sensation of depth from aerial perspective. Relative density and heighten the visual field. Can we design displays that when properly seated faultlessly recreate these? Yeah, they're called televisions. And so I would argue where we haven't been is where things are hard, which is what uh, Vishen and Cutting call the personal and action spaces. Everything within my reach, the people I can hit by throwing this uh, presentation remote, you are in my action space. And in that space, new depth cues come into play. Binocular disparity, motion parallax, convergence and accommodation. If you're gonna work on VR and AR, imaging and display technologies, here you go, from first principles, you're definitely working on these. The one thing we have failed to depict in any display and capture technology to date is vergence and accommodation cues, which we'll be talking about today. Not because it's the most important cue, it's actually the least important cue, but it's the only thing we're left. It's the one thing we gotta get right to finish the journey and then focus on making things great. And why we built so many headsets you're about to hear about, to address the least important depth cue possible because we're trying to fill in the table. Before that table is complete, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We need to give humans the full sense of depth cues and then make those cues accurate and have high dynamic range. You spent decades getting what could make VR headsets better. You start with the obvious stuff. Gee, it'd be nice if they're more ergonomic, if they're lighter, if they're wider field of view, if they're brighter. But you gotta ask, is that really delivering something of value to the overall experience if there's still missing things. Pay attention to the subtle things. So we had an early Oculus headset, confidential, have to sign an NDA to see. If you're gonna show off VR and AR, it shouldn't be in the Vista space. And so this entire little world was like a toy box. It's called Paper Town. So every character is like action figure size. The entire world fits within arm's reach, which means motion parallax, binocular disparity, and vergence and accommodation are the most salient cues to depth. It is more viscerally near you than any television can depict. And so I saw this beautiful toy world, put on the headset, I'm like, this is great, this is great. I leaned in to look at these little figures, and all of a sudden, I hope you can see this, they were thrown out of focus. And so looking in on this campfire and being frustrated with the blur, I didn't know what was going on. And it took me a while to convince people this was a problem because unfortunately, for those of you who are over the age of 60 or so, if you wear bifocals or progressive lenses, VR is great, and I'll explain why in a minute, but those of us who still have some years to go, you will see blurry objects in the near field. All right, so let's dive in. What is the solution and cause of this problem? It's virgin's accommodation conflict. Here is that cartoon little toy box world I'm trying to look at that fire hydrant on the bottom. Let's look from the side here. Here are my eyes looking at the model. Now, first of all, in order to see things in stereo, you need to verge your eyes to have a low enough binocular disparity that your vision system can process it. So when you verge, you also need to focus, right? The crystalline lens of our eye is there to make sure we always get a sharp image on our retina, and it needs to be a lens to collect enough light so that we can actually get a signal. So vergence, the act of rotating your eyes inward to look at something, is yoked to accommodation. And so when you verge, you also drive the focus of your system to be at that vergence point. There's a simplification, but that's it, basically what happens. So what happens? Well, the fire hydrant comes into sharp focus, you see it in stereo, and if you attend to a distant object, it'll be blurry. If you take your finger out, bring it to your face, Close one eye, make sure you can focus on the ridges of your finger. So now, given that ridges on your finger, if you attend but not look at the distance, I should be super blurred, and then if you do the opposite, vice versa. So that's vergence and accommodation, blur is a depth cue. So if you look in the distance, you look at this skyline, your eyes will verge far away, accommodation will move with vergence, and you'll notice the blur has changed. Near objects are now blurry, far objects are sharp. Now, what happens when I put on a VR headset? So when you put on a VR headset, 
At first, it seems pretty good. Those of you who've worn a VR headset, it's probably not that bad of an experience. You look far away, it's actually better than the reality. Near objects are usually blurry in reality. They're now sharp. And why is that? Well, VR headsets have a lens with fixed focus. And so if you take a thin lens, look it up in Wikipedia, put it at its focal length from a screen, it'll create a virtual image at infinity. So generally, VR headsets are optimized to make good images of things far away, which means the fire hydrant in a VR headset is actually focused at the same distance as the distant skyline. Everything's far. But that means you need to add digital blur if you want it to be correct, would be one way to go. Now, what do you think happens if I try focusing near in a VR headset? What happens is the video I showed earlier, which is everything gets blurry. Hopefully now it's clear why. Because a VR headset is focused far. That's fact one. Fact two, vergence and accommodation are linked. So if I verge near, everything's focused far. It's like throwing the lens out of focus on a camera. Not just near objects, but near and far objects are blurry. There's no amount of deconvolution or image processing that's gonna get you out of this because there's no negative light. You are stuck. Things are blurry, and if you wait long enough, they'll get sharp, but you'll wear bifocals in real life, so it's not a great solution. So what do we do? And so you try to solve this problem. The rows of this are all the possible technologies that could address vergence accommodation conflict, right? Fixed focus, monovision, verifocal, holography, uh, light fields, all these stuff we'd, we'd publish so many SIGGRAPH papers on. And then the columns are the dimensions you care about as engineers. Resolution, field of view, eye box. If you look at this and you believe the color coding, and I never believe the color coding if someone else did it, but if you believe me, there's only one thing here, two things here that look like good solutions. The first and best solution to all problems in life is to ignore the problem. If you just stick with fixed focus, there's no problem as long as objects stay in the vista space. If objects are far away, they'll be sharp. Problem solved. Unfortunately, VR is not a great television. It's great for personal and action space. And so you gotta solve it, which means there's one thing left, verifocal. Verifocal has only two red boxes. You're gonna need eye tracking. Nah, okay, well everyone's working on eye tracking, so that's okay. And you're gonna need an adaptive optic. Go to any optics conference, there's a ton of ways to change focus. And so that's what we set our sights on uh, about five years ago now to build the world's first fully functional end-to-end -end verifocal headset and to see if it's any good knowing that this is the least important depth cube. We knew that it was sort of a thankless task, but we did it nonetheless. For most individuals under the age of, I don't know, let's say 45, 50, you can at least accommodate over four diopters, 25 centimeters to optical infinity when you're corrected to normal. So what we would do is take a normal VR headset and change its focus over a four diopter range based on eye tracking. This is not a new idea. To my knowledge, Shiwa in 1996 were the first to propose and demonstrate this in a lab. And so my friend Ryan Ebert, the lead mechanical engineer I work with, took about two weeks and threw this thing together, prototype one. And in prototype one, we got rid of eye tracking. We we're like, that's a problem for another day. Let's just lean in and see that fire hydrant sharp and clear and be happy and try to convince people this is a problem wor worth working on. And in those two weeks, Ryan developed a high-speed actuation system, but not a silent one, because this is phase one. It's loud, but it can move orders of magnitude faster than the crystalline lens in your eye. So it's over-engineered to see what it'll ultimately need to be. So we put that all together, and it convinced us, yeah, everyone in the lab saw it. They're like, okay, I get it. So about a year after this demo, we said we had to do it for real. We had to have eye-tracked, verifocal, running Oculus games. So this one was a beast. It weighed two kilograms, but is, to my knowledge, the first fully functional verifocal headset ever built. And here's what it looked like. So again, fully functional. You have real game content. On the bottom left, you can see the eye tracking signal. On the bottom right, you can see me moving with real-time six-off tracking. This is what a verifocal experience looks like. So you pick up the controller. You can see the little gaze fiducial show me where I'm looking. And then we add the depth of field blur digitally. So when you look far, near objects are correctly blurred because those photons are done computationally. And there you have it. And you'll even notice the distortion correction changes dynamically because the way we changed focus changes distortion, field distortion as well. So it sounds good, but actually does not sound good at all because here's what it sounded like. <laughs> it 
So this was many years ago at this point. And so over a year period, I can't claim any credit other than managing the program. Ryan Ebert and the mechanical engineering team produced this thing. It weighs like a modern virtual reality headset. And inside of it, that crazy loud actuator you saw early was miniaturized and made near absolutely silent. I mean, you really gotta like hold your head against the device to hear anything. Vibration free, again, unless you like put your face against that part of the device. I didn't use Paper Town, I should have, but I didn't film it. So I used a different Oculus demo, but on the left you can see with varifocal off, emulating the focus of a human eye, very blurry text in the near field. Try the demo, message me if it's not blurry when you try it. And on the right, very sharp text. Great, modern VR headsets, if we so wanted, could have eye tracking, could address Virgin's accommodation conflict, if only we allowed moving parts. So where do you go from there? So even though we made the device silent, even though it was vibration free, we knew if we could have an electro-optic solution, no moving parts, of course everyone would be happier. And so, three and a half years of effort produced these headsets. We threw them away and we said, let's start again and make a headset that is the smallest, lightest VR headset made, best resolution we can make, no moving parts varifocal with eye tracking, and we did it. We showed it to the world earlier, about a few months ago. Uh, Half Dome 3 uh, is a folded optic headset, very high resolution, super ergonomic, and no moving parts varifocal. So let's take a look inside of this device to learn how it worked. I love these exploded view diagrams. This is my favorite. So on the right is everything inside of Half Dome 1. So you can see the motors, the enclosure. To get that huge field of view, it's just optics. It requires a, a large volume. On the left, we still have 20 to 20% 20 more field of view than a modern VR headset. So it's still, it's incredibly small and no moving parts electronic varifocal. And so here's what Afsun and Yang Zhao, an optical scientist on my team, put together, uh, along with a lot of engineers. This is an electronic varifocal module that is a set of six liquid crystal lenses. So they're thin, uh, diffractive optical elements made of liquid crystal that essentially give you a different programmable focal length from a flat lens. In between them, we place switchable half wave plates. So you can think of this as a stack of binary lenses. Let me explain it better. So on the right, you can see a module. When you turn this lens on, or the switchable half wave technically, you focus on the near dinosaur. When you turn it off, you get a far focus. You get the other focal length. And so now by stacking up a set of these with carefully designed focal lengths, you get an electronic lens that in this case has 64 focal states. And if you wanted 128, you just add one more lens. So this gives you, at least for a human, a smooth varifocal experience with no moving parts. And to prove it's real, you know, it's like the newspaper clipping, you gotta show a through the lens image. So this is a through the lens image of once again someone's moving the focus of a camera to follow the focus of the headset to see no flicker, no changes in brightness, no changes of color. Of course, that was what took a year and a half to make this thing that compelling. And so I really want to thank Afsun, Yong, and the rest of the team for pioneering this and giving me all the credit by getting to talk about it publicly, so thank you. So there you have it. That was our journey on electronic varifocal. If I achieve my dream and someday you all have varifocal headsets, then you get this, which is also not reality. Everything is now sharp and focused no matter where you look, which from a vision science perspective is a gap with reality, which we do not want to persist because it's a depth cue. And so this is where the computational bit comes in. It's really image processing. How do you add blur in and what should that blur be? And Marty Banks, once again, is the pioneer in this field. He's shown in, in early work that rendering so here's no blur. Blur like this isn't enough. So this blur is, is just like a disk blur applied as a function of depth. It's a spatially varying, non-separable blur kernel. That's the same in each color channel. Marty has tested whether that hypothesis is true and found that if you blur differently in the different color channels, that actually is a cue to drive uh, the vision system. So this blur isn't quite right. And so we saw this process over and over that even for varifocal, we didn't know what type of blur we needed to add, and we could not optimize the algorithm until we knew what it was, so we needed a one-size-fits-all algorithm that no matter what the blur ends up being, the performance will be about the same. And so, first you see if this is really a problem. Can you ignore it? 
I was what I told you at the beginning. The best solution is to ignore the problem. It turns out, no. You know, through the literature, it's very clear that blur is acute depth. It is a driver not only to accommodation but to vergence itself. We got to get this cue correct eventually, so you can't ignore the problem. When you have a verifocal display, you now know this very well from this talk, as your eyes accommodate and you verge through the scene, essentially nothing happens if you're doing the job right. The only thing you got to do is render blur that's depth dependent. But that's a spatially varying blur kernel. It's very hard to do with a real-time graphics engine. But as with many researchers who got their PhDs a few years ago, I was not trained but have heard of deep learning. And so Lei Xiao joined my team, and I said, Lei, I know nothing about real deep learning. I took a course in grad school on non-deep learning. Do you think deep learning can be a miracle for this field? And he said, I don't know, let's see. So here's what we did. If you're a game developer, you have a game engine that gives you a color buffer and a depth buffer. If you can generate all these outputs from a color buffer and a depth buffer, then you can drive any computational display just by retraining. And if Marty Banks tells you you need to change that blur a little bit, change your training database, don't change your algorithm. There's only one algorithm, which is go to an artist, generate a training database, and go rerun it. Now, it didn't kill the algorithm because someone has to make a, a network that is, has few enough layers that it can run in real time on a mobile processor. So there's still a compute challenge, but it means we did not need to solve a numerical optimization problem from scratch for every computational display. So this is the network that Lei Xiao came up with. We call it deep focus. To my knowledge, it's the first time deep learning has been used end to end to train a computational display. So put it all together on four GPUs at the time. And just by changing one input, you put color and depth in and you ask where you'd like it to be blurred, you can see between ground truth and deep focus, at your distance, I don't think you can tell the difference. Which is very different, that you've seen blur in video games, but is not designed to be accurate as it falls on your retina. It may look subtle, but compared to ground truth, all these existing methods generally don't quite get the blur around disocclusions correct. And that's, of course, what's driving the vision system, I would hypothesize. I'll use a basic image quality metric, SSIM. And here you can see that a lot of the, the problem with depth blur comes about at the edge, which is unfortunately where the salient information is. So there you go. The first deep learning algorithm for computational displays. This is an A-B comparison between accumulation buffer, which is ground truth, and deep focus on the right. And here you can see toggling between near focus and far focus. Uh, and so I hope all of you get a chance to see something like this uh, someday. I think all of us who are researchers are driven to do the unexplored territory. And it's really ultimately why I committed the, this phase of my career to virtual and augmented reality, is I saw there was much more low-hanging fruit that needed to be grabbed. And so with head-mounted displays, in five years, we found a viable path to addressing vergence accommodation conflict. Of course, when you're in a corporate R&D environment, there's that tension between wanting to drive the company forward right now and doing something that actually moves the field forward. And I hope we struck a balance.